Good afternoon, class. We're gonna we're going to I guess finish up uh, this section or or the course uh, material for our class on you know health informatics, healthcare informatics. Um, and last time we talked about uh, artificial intelligence and healthcare as kind of a topic that a lot of students are interested in. Uh, not only a lot of students are interested in it, but if you listen again to the talking heads on TV, everybody is focused on you know, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is driving the stock market. Artificial intelligence is driving, you know, NASDAQ, S&P 500. And, and everybody that you listen to tends to imply that artificial intelligence is going to um, be the next huge efficiency improvement across the board, not just in healthcare, but other entities. But we're gonna consider, we're gonna concentrate mostly on healthcare in this one. And so we talked about artificial intelligence tonight or this afternoon, we're gonna spend a few minutes, those of you going into the healthcare environment are going to hear a lot about not only artificial intelligence that we talked about last time, but you're gonna hear a lot about value-based healthcare, value-based pricing. Um, value-based benefit plans, value-based contracts. And it's not going to matter really whether you're on that uh, the payer side of that financial coin or the provider side of that financial coin. It's something that at least you need to be aware of. And depending on, or even if you go into public policy, that, you know, CMS has been focused on, you know, value-based pricing and value-based, you know, healthcare services for, for several years now. So, you, you need to be aware of at least a high level overview of value-based pricing. Because again, if you go into the healthcare market, I think you're gonna to be touched or you're gonna to touch on value-based pricing somewhere along the way. And I wanna just read you a few figures that I jotted down off the internet, just to give you an idea of why value-based pricing uh, is coming to the forefront and, uh, and is, is focused as much as it is uh, again, on either side of that either side of that financial coin, uh, you had in 1970, healthcare expenditures were 74.1 billion. 2000, 1.4 trillion. 2022, four and a half trillion. And what we're talking about, the, these are huge numbers when you think about them. And if and if you feel like you like you know percentage basis better. Uh, in 2018, it had increased 4.8 percent over 2017. 2019, it, it increased another 4.6 percent. 2020, it again driven by COVID, it kind of skews this number, but 10.6 percent. 2021, another 3.2 percent, and finally 4.1 percent in 2022. So. Doesn't matter whether you're looking at just the gross dollars of healthcare expenditures or percentage increases in healthcare expenditures, you can see something has got to happen. Something needs to give in order to get our arms around just this out, outrageous spending on healthcare expenditures. And then also, kind of overarching on top of that, you've got the US Healthcare Fraud and Abuse Control Program estimates. That of these expenditures, and we go back to 2022, the four and a half trillion dollars expended on healthcare goods and services in the United States, about 25% of that is waste and abuse. Duplicate services, repetitive services, um, un unauthorized services, the you know, services that had no um, place being provided, whether in a in a Physician's office, urgent care, emergency room, hospital, uh, ambulatory surgery, doesn't matter what the environment, but were provided on the providers, that be provided on the provider side, that doesn't make much sense, but occurred on the uh, provider side of that financial coin, and they were redundant. It had no impact on the treatment protocol that was going to drive the positive outcome for that patient. And that is the incentive, or that, I, don't, I can't say really the overall incentive, but it is one of the incentives of value-based pricing is to minimize the waste and abuse that occurs in, in the provision of healthcare goods and services. So 
with that in mind, we're going to, to talk about it. And you'll see it. It'll say, you know, you'll see it in the literature and it'll be value-based healthcare, or you'll see the acronym VBHC. Uh, and it's basically a framework for structuring healthcare systems with the overarching goal of value for, for patients with value defined as health outcomes per unit cost. That's how they're trying to try to determine with the value defined as healthcare outcomes or health outcomes per unit of cost. And again, it's going back to earlier on in, in, in this course, we talked about your health status. Individuals should be managing that health status. You want to optimize your health status for a longer, healthier life. You want to minimize the deterioration or the depreciation in your health status, depending on your nomenclature that you feel most comfortable with as you go out through life. And that should be the goal of this value-based uh, healthcare approach or, or let's say strategy. Uh, it was introduced by uh, some of you that have had my uh, strategic management or even my leadership classes, uh, it was introduced by our, our, our good friend, Michael Porter, uh, Harvard Business School, along with Elizabeth Olmstead Teesburg in 2006. Uh, and that was, while the concept was not exactly novel at that point, but Porter and, and, and Teesburg provided an infrastructure. So you had, uh, you had health plans and providers had operationalized some aspects of it as early as the late 80s, early 1990s. But again, academics, one of the things they are um, very efficient at is providing an infrastructure and they provide the infrastructure. And uh, when we talk about you know, value-based healthcare, uh, the implementation of the aspects were as early as the 1990s. You had patient value as the ultimate goal, even in the 1990s. Um, emphasis was, uh, you know, systematic measurement of outcomes and costs. And when I started in healthcare in um, the early 1990s, 91, you know, to be exact, there was a lot of emphasis in Southern California talking about capitation. Providers wanted to be capitated, and they they wanted to manage that bucket of money that healthcare uh, plans were paying for their goods and services. They felt like that they could manage the bucket of money more effectively and provide higher value to patients in Southern California. And health plans looked at it, and I looked at it the same way as other health plans did. It was an opportunity to control costs because you were you were cutting a check for a provider on a monthly basis based on the number of members enrolled with that provider, enrolled on their, uh, uh, with their office, and you would cut them a per member per month check. And a lot of the per member per month checks were cut to primary care docs and it would say, okay, doc, we're gonna give you $120 for each of your members on a monthly basis and you have to provide healthcare as you see fit for your covered population. And the only thing you're going to get paid is $120. Um, some of the contracts had carve outs for pharmaceuticals. So we would take that $120 and let's say we would uh, cut out 10%. We'd put you know 12 bucks of that $120 in a risk pool. And between the health plan and the provider, we would manage that risk pool on the pharmaceuticals, and at the end of the day, let's say at the end of the year, not just the end of the day, but at the end of the year, we'd reconcile everything and we'd split, let's say that, you know, rather than $12 a month, uh, it averaged out $10 a month on the pharmaceuticals for each of those members. That was $2 left over, $2 times the membership times 12 months had the pool of dollars left over, and typically the health plan and the provider split at 50-50. So that's kind of how capitation worked at least in the 90s or early 90s. Uh, and it talked about what not only value-based health care, but capitation just in general, it started the restructuring of provider organizations and provider practices. You started seeing a lot of these so-called physician extenders. 
And what the physician extenders were, uh, there were nurse practitioners, they were, you know, physician's assistants, um, there were, um, some of them were DOs, some of them, if you were an orthopedic group, you may have had a, a PT and a nurse practitioner doing the majority of the work and your orthopod would come in if there was an issue. So you had a lot of these physician extenders and with the addition of physician extenders, <clears throat> physicians themselves could see a lot more patients. They could have a lot more patients assigned to their panels. So they were generating on the per member per month side and remember revenue, and it doesn't matter whether it's whether it's volume based or you know capitated or whatever. Revenue is generally driven by prices times quantity. If the price was one hundred twenty dollars per month for all the healthcare services for that member received, then what you want to do to drive revenue is increase your membership. You want to increase your membership from say two thousand members on your panel to twenty five hundred. That drove your revenue. And so providers were doing that by bringing on physician and extenders, taking care of a lot of the uh, goods and services that could be handled at a lower level and only referred within that practice to that physician. And again, we were talking about an orthopod, referring to that orthopedics or orthopod to take care of the, of the more difficult cases. So that's why you had restructuring of these physician um, panels or physician organizations, and you're going to see as, so in the 90s, capitation, everybody wanted on board, probably by the mid 90s, maybe in the later 90s, physicians were going out of business, they were going bankrupt, they couldn't manage the money. And so it, it kind of went from fee for service, it went to capitation and went back to fee for service, and now it's kind of this roller coaster. It kind of almost reminds you a little of a business cycle with the ebbs and flows. And now it's moving back toward value based healthcare with the value based methodology that's been refined over time. But again, value based healthcare is going to restructure the way that organizations, especially on the provider side, are going to be um, organized. And you're also talking about cost reductions on value-based healthcare cost reductions, while they are a portion of the strategy to control that five and a half, four and a half trillion dollars that we saw in 2022, it's not the ultimate part of the strategy. Because if, if providers are, are developing treatment protocols and treatment plans that are in the best interest of the patients, then it should take care of some of that 25% that is waste and abuse within the healthcare environment. Also, healthcare outcomes have to improve to enhance value. You have to have outcomes improving to enhance the value. Actually, outcomes have to improve to justify this model of value-based healthcare. And again, outcomes improve Health status should improve. As health status should improve, it implies that we are optimizing the, or in, in this case, minimizing the deterioration or the depreciation of your health of your health status going forward. And we're going to talk just a few minutes about uh, the value-based healthcare model, and it provides work, so it incentivizes. Providers to work with patients to determine a treatment plan that is in the best interest of the patient and then measure the relevant clinical results. And one way that uh, kind of one thing I, I skipped over, but we'll kind of quickly go back to it. One thing that, that the early on onset of capitation in the 90s and you know even in, even into the early 2000s that has we we have determined and we have learned from as we go to value based healthcare it's to transition toward what's considered bundle payments and when we talk about bundle payments and this is going to tie into the value based healthcare model we're talking about bundle page and payments we're talking about um, the part you know, cardiovascular procedures, talking about especially orthopedic procedures 
And on bundle payments, we'll just talk quickly about um, a knee replacement. You go into your doctor's office, you go into your primary care doctor's office. Primary care doctor's office say, yeah, you know, you, you, I'm afraid. And, you know, he's taking some x-rays and he's looking at them and he says, you know, your knee is just starting to deteriorate. I'm afraid it's not going to get any better without a total knee replacement. You say, okay. He takes and he refers you to an orthopedic surgeon. An orthopedic surgeon may use that x-ray, may take some other they take some an MRI or a CAT scan or some other type of radiology, radiological procedure. And he looks at it and said, yeah, your primary care doc's right. He said, we're going to have to do a, uh, a complete knee replacement. We're going to schedule you for a month. And so what happens when we're talking about bundle payments or bundle services, and we're, again, we're going to talk about a complete knee replacement, you as an analyst, whether you're on the provider side or the payer side, it's not going to matter. You as an analyst are going to have to determine what would be the cost or what would be the value of that knee replacement. And basically, you have to determine a model that's going to capture those costs. And so a lot of these bundle payments are going to, it's going to set up and it's going to say, okay, we will pay for all the costs from T equals zero to 180 days out. And so T equals zero is the day that you went in to see your primary care doc. So that starts the ticker, starts at T equals zero, one, two, three. So, and then any service from that doctor visit all the way out to 180 days after that doctor visit are going to be paid for within this bundle payment. It's going to be a lump sum payment that's going to go usually to the orthopod, it could go to a hospital because somebody has to be the manager of the services. So let's say if that bundle payment, they've arrived and it's they've decided, you know, the health plan and the orthopod have negotiated back and forth and said, okay, for a bundle payment and 180 days out, we're going to charge, you know, we have to have $60,000. The health plan agrees to it. And so that becomes your bundle payment. The health plan will pay a lump sum of $60,000 for that bundle payment for that knee replacement. And that orthopod, in more than likely in conjunction with the hospital, are going to have to work through a strategy that they know they're not going to be paid any more than $60,000. Now, if they can provide that service for less than $60,000, they're, they're going to have what you're you know, considered economic rents on top of you know, the profit margins they have built into the normal cost, there's some economic rent sitting out there that they can grab and split. So the goal is whatever that, whatever that bundle payment is, whatever that value is, the surgeon, the hospital, um, anesthesiologist, everybody working under there, they know going in, $60,000 is all going to get paid. If it costs more than $60,000, they have to eat that cost. So that's the rationale for bundle payments. And bundle payments are an all are a kind of an offshoot of the early on capitated models. Um, bundle payments learn from the capitated models, and value-based healthcare is going to rely on bundle payments for a lot of these services as they try to roll up and try to control that 25% of that four and a half million that was in 2022 that was waste and abuse redundant services. And so as you get into this value-based model, it's up to you as the patient and your provider, starting with your primary care doc, but it's up to you and your provider to manage that agent principal issue we've talked about, to manage the asymmetric information, to manage that SID, that supplier-induced demand in such a way then you have a treatment protocol that is going to be conducive to driving the highest probability of a positive outcome. And again, that's, that is one of the drivers of this value-based of healthcare is providing a positive outcome, the highest value of an outcome to the patient. Uh, now, you know, part of the debate in, in this value-based healthcare is 
patient experience and satisfaction varies greatly with quality of care, and it may or not be uh, a component of the value-based health care. And one reason is experience with treatment rather than medical effectiveness. So patients may be focused on the treatment. How were they treated? And was there satisfaction with the treatment as opposed to it may not be transparent how effective the medical treatment plan was. And to kind of offset these, there are surveys and there are patient experience surveys that are built into these value, you know, value-based healthcare plans. And the gen then the impetus being not only are you trying to control value trying to ensure value, trying to control cost, trying to maximize patient satisfaction, but you're also trying to maximize the medical appropriateness or the medical efficacy or the medical effectiveness of the goods and services that are provided. Um, and, you know, cost reduction is a component and healthcare costs, if they're more readily available to patients, becomes a patient-centric opportunity for the patients. Um, when I worked at United Healthcare, I could get on my computer and if my provider gave me a prescription for a pharmaceutical, I could get on um, the, you know, the computer and I could price it using United's pricing methodology in the system. I could check Costco, I could check Sam's Club, I could check Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, I could check it all, I could shop for the best price, and I could go into Costco, which was usually my best price, and get my pharmaceutical bill for me. Again, it's making the patient, value-based healthcare, one of the drivers is to make it more patient-centric, make the patient a larger part of the process and a larger part of determining the treatment protocol moving forward. And one thing that that has just changed over, you know, I left United in 2010 and came to Blue Cross Blue Shield. So one of the things that's changed is just the technology and, you know, the mobile devices. And, and now I can use my cell phone. I don't even have to be around a computer. I go to Costco and I've got one of those little, um, you know, I can, good RX, one of those little applications on my phone. I can go in and I can present my prescription Costco will say, okay, here's what your health plan, I'm with Aetna now. They'll say, here's what Aetna's going to pay for this pharmaceutical. I can get on Costco and I can say, type in and I can put the pharmaceutical information in and I can get the Costco price. Let's say Aetna pays $50 for the script. Costco pays $45. I can also get on this good RX and, and type it in. Let's say good RX pays $40. I can show that on my phone to Costco and Costco will only charge me $40 for the script. So patients now, there is there are a lot of mobile device applications that will allow healthcare goods and services to be more customer centric. And the more customer centric healthcare goods and services are, the greater the probability that the combination of members providers and health plans can control the, the waste and abuse that is inherent. Again, that approximate 25% of that four and a half trillion in 2022 could have been controlled with better access to information. And with that, we're going to stop. And when we come back, we're going to talk about value-based insurance design. Talk to everybody in a few minutes.